thank you for the introduction. Um, so first, I just want to show you a little bit about the background uh, to my research. So this is a chart that uh, is presented by NREL uh, occasionally. Um, and it, it charts the progress of each technology in solar cell research. Um, so you can match, or so you can watch the efficiency as the years go on. Um, and as you can see, many decades go into a lot of these technologies, uh, in some cases over 30 years. Um, but you can see that for most of them, it's a very steady increase in, in efficiency increase. Um, however, if you look in the bottom right corner, uh, the yellow dots with the uh, red accent around it are the perovskite solar cells. Um, so these, as you can tell, are, are very rapidly increasing in efficiency and have only been around for a few years. So that's very exciting, and that's why it's, it's such an exciting uh, field of research to work in. Um, and, but what are perovskites? Uh, so this is a perovskite structure. Uh, in this case, uh, we're using lead iodide octahedra. Uh, so that's what the... Uh, this lead iodide octahedra. So there's a lead in the center of this octahedron with six iodides around it. And each adjacent lead will share one iodide, uh, which is the corner of those octahedra. So that's why we share, that's why, that's why we say it's corner sharing octahedra. And then this will form a three-dimensional framework in all directions, and it's negatively charged. So to balance that charge, you need a methyl ammonium cation that resides in the cavity. Uh, so uh, these, this material is very nice. It has a very uh, uh, good band gap for solar cells, around 1.6 eV. And it's a direct band gap absorber, which means that it has a very, uh, uh, it absorbs a lot of light uh, for a very small amount of material. So because of that, you can form thin film devices. Um, and so this is an example of, a, of an architecture here for a device. However, it's not perfect. There are some concerns that we have to address before uh, we move forward with it. Uh, one uh, is the toxicity of the lead, especially for a material that is slightly water soluble. Uh, and then the stability of the material, both to light and to moisture. Um, so the light issue, uh, my uh, Hema talked about earlier, um, uh, we could see segregation of iodide um, in the material, potentially decomposition uh, we don't really know too much about that right now. Uh, the moisture stability, though, is, is really apparent in the laboratory. If you leave a film out, um, it'll convert uh, fairly quickly. Uh, one other issue, uh, mostly for research purposes, is the consistency of the film formation. Uh, many labs have their own techniques that they report. However, it's really hard to reproduce those. Um, and so if, if we could come up with a material or a technique for deposition, that's easy for everyone to do, uh, that'd be really, really helpful. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce to you uh, a different class or a different uh, type of material um, that's very related that we call the layered perovskites. And so this here on the left is a very typical example of a layered perovskite. We still call it a perovskite because it's corner sharing octahedra, uh, in, in this case of lead iodide octahedra. But uh, because we're adding in larger organic cations, we're separating uh, different layers of that material, uh, so we actually get a layered structure. Uh, this, however, is uh, just one of many types of uh, layered perovskites that we like to call the n greater than one structures. Um, and so the n value here is essentially counting the number of lead iodide octahedra in each sheet. And so I, I showed you before the n equals one. However, the n equals two and three are shown here as well. And hypothetically, you could get any structure you wanted. Uh, in reality, it's, it's pretty hard to get some of the ones with higher n values. But if you take this to the limit, you eventually get out n equals infinity, which is actually just the three-dimensional structure that I talked about before. So these materials, the layered materials are really nice uh, because you're adding in this organic molecule. And uh, you can uh, imagine adding any functionality you wanted into that material just by using uh, organic chemistry um, to put anything uh, that fits inside of the structure. Um, so the layered perovskites also tend to have different properties. Uh, for example, something very important to solar cells uh, are the band gap and the exciton binding energy of these materials. Uh, as you go to smaller n values, you're reducing the dimensionality and therefore reducing the size of that box, and you're increasing the, the band gap of the material. Also, the exciton binding energy increases. Um, so therefore, when you create a whole and electron pair, 
in the material, it's much harder to separate those uh, and do work using the device. Um, and so uh, we decided to, to explore the n equals three material uh, because this is a nice intermediate between the two extremes. You still get something that approaches the three-dimensional material, hopefully in its electronic and optical properties. However, you still get to use the layered structure with the larger organic molecules, and therefore you can add in any functional functionality you want into the material in the future. So uh, I was able to synthesize this material shown here. This is a crystal structure that we collected and solved ourselves. Uh, it is phenethyl ammonium, methyl ammonium, lead iodide, the N equals three perovskite. Like I said, it, it retains a similar structure um, to the three-dimensional perovskite and will hopefully then have the same prop or very similar properties. It is solution processable like the three-dimensional material. Um, however, in this case, it's actually easier to make films out of this material, uh, both uh, because of the layered structure, um, allowing you to, to spin the material down on a substrate more easily, but also because uh, you can do it in ambient conditions, which is nice. Um, and uh, after you make the film, it is also more stable to moisture than three-dimensional material, and I'll talk about that uh, later on. Uh, but some things to consider, like I said, these layered materials have larger band gaps, which means you're absorbing less of the spectrum. We think this material might actually be better for a tandem device. Um, and then another thing uh, that we hope to address in the future is a possibility of uh, limited carrier transport, mostly in the vertical direction in that figure. Uh, you can imagine it might be hard for a carrier to hop from one uh, sheet of lead iodide uh, octahedra down to the next. So um, making films of this material is, is very easy. Uh, we use a single step solution uh, spinning, uh, sorry, spinning step um, from a one molar uh, lead concentration in DMF. Uh, shown here on the left is an SEM of uh, the N equals three material. And it's really hard to see much because it's really flat. Uh, but if you try and do the same technique with the 3D perovskite shown there on the right, um, first of all, you need to anneal it to actually form the material. So that's one step that's extra. But also, even when you do that, there are holes all over the film, um, which is not good for a thin film device. Uh, you can make nice films with the three-dimensional material. However, um, they are much more difficult. There are a few reported out there uh, that I'll mention briefly here. You can start with a lead iodide uh, film, PBI2, that has to start out like a, as a very nice film, uh, and then you uh, convert it at high temperatures using methyl ammonium vapor. You can also add a polymer to the solution spinning step, um, or even you can do a, a co-evaporation shown here on the right, uh, which is where you have very high temperature um, sources of PBI2 and methyl ammonium iodide that in the vapor phase under vacuum will condense on your substrate. If you want to look at any material as an absorber in a solar cell, you need to know the optical properties. Um, there's a few things you can get out of these types of measurements. Uh, one is the band gap of the material, or at least an estimate of it. Um, that, therefore, you will know where in the solar spectrum it will absorb. Uh, but you can also get an idea of the relative energy levels in the material uh, beyond just the band gap. Um, so I'll talk about that, uh, a little bit about that. Uh, in blue on the left is an absorbance spectrum of the three-dimensional perovskite, methyl ammonium lead iodide. That one will absorb around its band gap, around 1.6 eV, and, and all the energies above that. My material, because it has the higher band gap, does not absorb until higher energies. Um, but interestingly, we're seeing uh, peaks in the spectrum uh, in red there. Um, and on the next slide, I'll talk about what I think is going on. But uh, we've been able to identify these as the N equals one, two, three, four, and five materials um, uh, of the layered perovskites. So that was interesting to find there. Um, the photoluminescence shown there on the right uh, is important to know. Um, the blue scan, which is the methyl ammonium lead iodide 3D perovskite, uh, happens where uh, is reported in literature at around 1.6 eV. Uh, my material the photoluminescence occurs at a slightly higher energy, around 1.7. Um, so this is significant because you were getting uh, a higher energy photoluminescence, which is what you would expect from a higher band gap material. However, this photoluminescence is not actually occurring from the N equals three material in the film. So we think this is actually a lower energy material in the film uh, where all the carriers are collecting there and then photoluminescence is occurring from that material. Um, we do think it probably still is a layered perovskite, but it's not 
exactly the layered perovskite that we were searching for. So this is what we think is actually happening during film formation. Um, once you deposit the film down, we have large domains of n equals three material, the blue uh, octahedra up there. Um, and these are large domains uh, that will diffract x-rays. So we were able to take x-rays of these materials and confirm that it is exclusively by x-ray n equals three crystalline material. However, defect layers of the n equals one, two, four, and five uh, defect layers are in the film. Um, and because they're scattered and randomly distributed throughout the material, uh, you will not see them in the x-ray diffraction because there's not enough unit cells to diffract from. Uh, however, they will still have light passing through them and you will see the optical properties from those, from those layers. <clears throat> Importantly, this material is stable to humidity, both during the deposition but after. So here I've shown uh, a methyl ammonium lead iodide perovskite film that has been exposed to 52% relative humidity over 46 days. And even after four days, you see it's starting to convert into PBI2, lead iodide. Uh, and after 46 days, it's actually almost fully converted. Um, however, if you take my material and do the same experiment, after 46 days, it's essentially unchanged. Uh, this is very important for solar cells, both during the fabrication and after. You can imagine it would be a lot cheaper for a manufacturer to make a, a solar cell you know, lineup of roll to roll that is under air rather than under nitrogen. And finally, I was able to make devices. Um, so this uh, is essentially copying what's done by some people in the literature. Um, and uh, it's essentially a titania uh, compact layer, which is your n-type material, followed by the perovskite, your uh, hole conductor, which is a, an organic polymer, spiroomitad, and then gold. And you'll get light to go into the layer of the perovskite. Uh, you'll get your hole and electron pair. Uh, and then you will extract those into the uh, titania for the electron and the spiroomitad uh, for the hole. To test these devices, we took IV curves. Um, and uh, essentially what this is, is you are sweeping the voltage um, and measuring the current response when you're illuminating the, uh, the device. So what you want to see, as I've plotted it here, you want to see high voltages, so out to the right, and you want to see high currents, in this case negative currents, so down, uh, down to the bottom. Importantly, this material has a high VOC, which is where it crosses the x-axis. Uh, it's around 1.18 volts. Uh, this is a full 100 millivolts higher than a record cell for methyl ammonium light iodide. And in fact, most of those cells um, will actually be closer to around one volt. Um, so this is a higher VOC. Uh, we're getting uh, a, a pretty good JSC. So JSC is the short circuit current, which is at the y-axis. So this, this is essentially a measure of the photo current in the device. Um, it's certainly limited when you compare it to the 3D perovskite, uh, but we think it's very good for a first try. Um, and we think that increasing that uh, short circuit current or the photo current will allow for better devices in the future. And because of that slightly uh, smaller uh, photo current, we are getting an efficiency that's lower than 3D perovskites, just under 5% at around 4.73. Um, but we think hopefully in future generations we can improve that. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, conclude by, by um, reiterating that I was able to make this new material. I didn't say this before, but this is the first N equals three lead iodide perovskite ever reported. Uh, we were able to test the humidity stability of this material, um, and we show that it is uh, much more robust when you uh, expose it to a controlled humidity environment compared to the 3D perovskite. Um, but also, putting it in a device, it performs very well, especially as a first generation material, um, getting almost 5% uh, efficient. A conversion of the solar energy. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, GSEP for letting me speak today um, and for funding. I'd like to thank my PI, Hema, everyone in our group, uh, but specifically Diego, Emma, and Matt for their help on this project, um, and then Professor Michael McGee, um, and then his group, uh, specifically Eric, William, and Gray. And with that, I'll take any questions. Um, 
Did you make more than one of these devices? Yeah, yeah. I made a fairly large batch, um, a couple different batches, but uh, close to maybe like 20 cells, devices. Of each one? Um, so the illuminated area is around 0.12 square centimeters. Um, the full devices are closer to like one and a half square centimeters. Okay. And did all of them show the behavior that you showed in the IV curve? That is, the, the point below the fitted line, just below VOC, I mean the max power? Yeah, um, uh, so I, I didn't have time to talk about this, but these devices are very hysteretic in the JV curves. So if you measure one direction versus another, you'll get a different JV curve. Um, so I've tried to correct for that by doing very slow measurements, essentially holding at one voltage, um, measuring the current until it levels off and then moving on. Uh, in this case, uh, I, I did do that, but I didn't hold it for long enough at those near the max power point, and so it didn't level off completely, so that it's not exactly the, the current that you would actually get at that voltage. Uh, most of the devices that I, I did make did show that, though. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ian, I'm just wondering, from the absorption, can you estimate the relative abundance of the, the you know, the impurity, N equals one, equals two and four phases, and then mm -hmm. can you get some sense of the average domain size of the N equals three from the, from the X-ray? Because in your cartoon, it, it seemed to imply that you just had a random, you had N equals three, and then N equals one impurity, and then N equals three, and mm -hmm. then another impurity. I guess the alternative would be that you have very large and equal three domains, and then a region where it's one, four, two, where it's mm. where all of your impurities are kind of jammed into one section, and I then see. another large. So I'm just wondering if you can distinguish those. Yeah, um, I think it might be possible to quantify it using UV vis absorption. We weren't able to do that, um, especially because those higher n values, even starting with n equals three, are not very well characterized. The literature of the n equals one and two is fairly well known, more n equals one than, than n equals two. Um, but there are absorption spectra of pure n equals one material and two reported. Uh, the larger n values, it's really hard to make them in pure phase. We were able to crystallize the n equals three, uh, but in fairly small amounts and not really enough to do many quantitative measurements on. Uh, I think powder x-ray diffraction to get like, you know, the, the domain size of the n equals three uh, would also be possible, but it's very difficult, um, mostly because you have to form these as films. Uh, I have done some larger films that I've been able to scrape into a powder, which is essentially the only way to get a completely unoriented scan. Um, uh, however, it's, it's just hard to get enough material to get a nice scan. I think uh, one of the better powder x-rays I've gotten from these materials was a really long overnight scan on a very small amount of powder. Um, so. Uh, I think potentially, but we weren't able to. Do you think it matters with respect to your device performance? I think it does, definitely. Um, we're, I think we're stunting the VOC of this material, or sorry, these devices, because we have those lower energy uh, materials in there, the impurity phases. If we had exclusively N equals three, I think we would be able to bump the VOC up quite a bit. Um, the, I think the current density, I don't really know if that would be affected too much, because we might see a loss in current density possibly from those lower energy materials, which might actually have better carrier transport. Um, but yeah, we don't know for sure. I think it's, it's possible that we would increase or decrease that, I don't know. Cool. Um, how much does the series resistance increase from the bulk um, to, your, to your layered three, like three layer structure? Uh, the 3D perovskite, are you talking about the 3D perovskites? Yeah. yeah. Um, so those devices, uh, most people can make them such that the series resistance is pretty small. Um, I don't make those devices. Uh, I don't think I've ever made a complete device out of that material. Does your, um, does your cross plane conductivity decrease because you're basically cutting off the conduction pathway? Yeah, we do think we are limiting um, the, the, path, the, the current or the, uh, the mobility in that direction specifically. Um, uh, I did collect an EQE spectrum uh, and an IQE, and we do know that we're not getting all the carriers out that we generate, and we think that's probably because of the limited carrier uh, mobility. Um, so yeah, I think it's 
it's coming from that, likely.